but this process is aided by specific techniques of meditation, philosophical concepts, and thinkers who articulated them. So the path to silence, formlessness, and stillness can only be paved with the most exacting procedures of discipline and repetition. It is worth noting that alongside Gaitonde, abstraction in India developed in the herbs of relatively few practitioners, including Babu Rao Sadwilkar, K. Ambadas, Amina Ahmed Kar, Prabhakar Barve, Ram Kumar, Nasreen Mohammadi, Homi Patel, Raja, Mohan Samant, Lakshman Pai, Jaram Patel, Meli Gobai, and the neo tantrics such as Brain Day and G.R. Santosh. The traditions of figuration, expressionism, and narration weighed heavily on the South Asian creative mind, and artists working in this vein were favored politically by critics as representative voices of post-colonial resistance and nationhood. Art criticism in English, notwithstanding those in Hindi or various important vernacular outlets such as Marathi, from the 1940s onwards, was defined by journals such as Marg, Lalit Kala Contemporary, Link, Design, Thought, Contra 66, Art Trends, Prischik, Rupalekha, Journal of Arts and Ideas, and more recently by Art India magazine, as well as newspapers like The Statesman, The Times of India, The Illustrated Weekly of India, and The Indian Express. The impulse towards art criticism, however, lagged far behind art production, as is, commonly, as is commonly acknowledged amongst cultural producers in the field. One of the advocates for abstraction in India was Richard Bartholomew, a Burmese emigre who became a distinguished New Delhi-based art critic and comrade of many modernist artists from the mid-1950s through the mid-1980s, whom he also photographed. He favored a formalist tendency in his criticism towards poetics rather than politics and wrote for exhibition catalog entries, newspapers, and magazines such as Thought. Although Bartholomew's favored modernists were M.F. Hossein, Ram Kumar, Samant, and Satish Gujral, he was keen to describe the abstract turn deployed, deployed by figurative artists from the late 50s onwards and apart from writing extensively on Ram Kumar, also analyzed the works of Gaitonde, Raza, Krishna Reddy, Devayani Krishna and Tanwal Krishna, and Nasreen Mohammadi, for example. According to the critic, and I quote, abstract tendencies did not appear till the late 50s and were only a brief manifestation in the hands of a few. Expressionism, therefore, has been the clearest single trend with the majority following the mainstream, as it were, of the art movement. Though not a counter movement to expressionism, there was a preoccupation with phenomenal color in the mid-60s, which had nothing to do with op or its influence. Hossein, Samant, and Gaitonde had given color its fullest articulation. Nothing as complicated as color field painting emerged though our painters working in this area were undoubtedly aware of the work of Mark Rothko and Joseph Albers, for example. The discipline of the Tantra, and principally its schematic presentation as a Yantra, or geometrical formulation of the energies of Tantra, was the Indian inspiration and antecedent." End quote. Gaitonde was born in Nagpur, Maharashtra on November 2, 1924. After less than a year, his family relocated to Mapuza in Goa, where Gaitonde's parents were born. In 1928, the family moved to Bombay, where Gaitonde attended school while living in a chawl in Khotachivari, Girgaon. Gaitonde graduated from the JJ School of Art in Bombay in 1948 and became a fellow there from 1948 to 1950. The artist studied under Professor Jagannath Ahivasi, who familiarized him with compositional techniques associated with Indian mural painting and miniatures. Ahivasi was also very fond of devotional poems, 
literature, and classical music utilizing Braj Bhasha, and inspired his students to follow these traditions. The immediate post-independence years, 1947 to 1952, constitute a pivotal moment in Bombay when several progressive artists revolted against the pedagogical systems of the, of the academies to establish a new understanding of the modern. Apart from Gaitonde, leading artists like Tayab Mehta, Padamsi, Raza, and F. N. Souza attended the JJ School of Art at this time. Speaking of these vanguard artists who were born in the 1920s and came of age in the late 1940s, Geeta Kapoor states, and I quote, at that moment in 1947 and during the first decades of independence, there was, besides the nation and the republic and the promises and betrayals of these constitutive institutions, a world to be won in the way only modernity as an international project promised, here and everywhere else. And so this generation was destined to flag their dreams with that emancipatory, even utopic desire. In the early 1950s, Gaitonde was briefly affiliated with the Progressive Artists Group, alongside artists such as Ara, Bakre, Hossein, Khanna, and Mehta, and with the Bombay Group, which included Hebbar, Shankar, Palsikar, and Samant. Palsikar was a particularly interesting figure in this group. According to Akbar Padamsi, he was an influential teacher at the JJ School of Art during Gaitonde's tenure there, and was responsible for introducing his students to the works of Kandinsky, Picasso, Matisse, and Braque. He was known for his experimentation and erudition alike, and was equally familiar with the traditions of Indian aesthetic theory, the formal techniques and symbolism of Indian miniature painting, and folk iconography and patterning, which he passed along through his teaching. In the 1940s, artists working in Bombay came across reproductions of the art of European modernists through magazine and book illustrations, often in black and white, as well as through the pedagogy of the JJ School of Art. In 1947, the art milieu of the city was dominated by a few European critics and patrons, including Rudy von Leyden, Walter Langhammer, and Emanuel Schlesinger, Jewish emigres from Central Europe seeking refuge from fascism. They were familiar with the tenets of European modernism and showed a proclivity towards expressionism rather than abstraction. Together, they were important advocates of modernism and supported, the, and supported these fledgling Bombay artists in myriad ways. Gaitonde's oeuvre in the decade after art school, from 1948 to 1959, evinces a constant experimentation with triumphs and tribulations in various forms of figuration and Paul Klee-inspired watercolors and mixed-media works on paper. The artist's initial understanding of figuration, space, and abstraction was informed by traditional painting in India, which historically considered of mural painting, illustrated manuscripts, and cloth painting. Alongside Gaitonde's early inspiration from these traditions of Indian painting, and um, here's an example from the TIFR collection on the right. The artist also adopted Clay's expressiveness of line, color harmonies, and playfulness of spirit, as evidenced in various works from the 1950s. Khanna states, and I quote, in the early years, of course, Paul Klee had a great influence on all of these artists. It was a new chapter in painting, and it suited Gaitonde's temperament. And it suited the Indian temperament also. A lot of people were inclined. There was an exhibition which included Klee's work in Calcutta much, much earlier. This was in the, in the 20s. Klee was a teacher who was painting out his theories. He was very lyrical and was tempered by music and poetry, and that saved him. He made very poetic images. He took off from the figure and melded it into his theory, his color theory. Gaitonde was not a teacher. He never told people what to do. He really believed that we're on this earth, we're living here, we don't know what is beyond us or where we've come from, 
there's a whole mystery that surrounds the whole business of human existence. And he was deeply possessed with this very thought. Gaitonde was a perfect draftsman. He was not slovenly. There are many painters who don't know what the line can do. He was an impeccable painter, but he left that. It was a very conscious decision not to do that, to go to the non-figurative. He then goes into painting itself. The painting then has its own language, its own resonance, its ups and downs, its own life, and that's what he lived." End quote. Three of Gaitonde's works were included in the India Room at the Venice Biennial in 1954, and others were acquired the same year by the newly founded Lalit Kala Academy and National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi. In November 1957, Gaitonde was awarded the Fleischmann Prize at the first Young Asian Artists Exhibition in Tokyo, organized by the J Japan Cultural Forum. Two works were exhibited. Discussing Gaitoni's output in the mid to late 1950s, before his turn towards non-representation, critic Dhyaneshwar Nadkarni has stated, and I quote, I would suggest that we look at these different linear treatments not as something technical, but propelled by a deep humanity, by a sustained interest in the dynamic nature of life. This was some time before Gaitoni discovered this dynamism in that entity called space itself in the phenomenon called color. The shift to a monochromatic palette in 1961 with ink or ink and wash on paper accompanies Gaitonde's interest in Zen Buddhism and the principles of calligraphy, as is manifest in a suite of paper as is manifest in a suite of works on paper from the early 1960s. Together, these provide us with examples of Gaitonde's transposition of draftsmanship from figuration to non-representation through confident lines and bold forms. These reverberate alongside a string of canvases titled Painting Number no. 1, Painting Number no. 4, and Painting Number no. 6, all dating from 1962. Um, and I'd like to just show you, that's one, that's four, and that's six. Um, and this one is in a private collection in New York. This one is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And this one is in the collection of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And it took us about two years to ensure that the three of them would be hung together on a single wall at the Guggenheim. Here we see an opening up of space and a self-confident experimentation with form, color, and scale. Gaitonde applied thin layers of paint in various hues to create a subtle translucency and used a palette knife for the first time to achieve small areas of thick impasto. The immediacy of the hand of attention, intention, and gesture is experienced through the direct application of the roller and the palette knife. Together, these examples constitute an early cluster of works informed by Zen. And that's the same group uh, at the Peggy Guggenheim collection. And as part of our curatorial research for the project, uh, we were able to put together a very extensive exhibition history on Gaitonde, Day. And this is a wonderful archival image showing painting number two um, hanging in the Museum of Modern Art for one of their collection exhibitions in the 60s. Throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s, Indian artists were slowly establishing their credentials in America, due in part to the efforts of cultural diplomats like Abe Weisblatt, Tom Keane, and Porter McRae, working through Rockefeller-funded projects such as the Council on Economic and Cultural Affairs and the JDR Third Fund. In 1962, Krishan Khanna was the first Indian artist to be awarded a fund grant to live and work in New York. 
Gaitone received the same grant in 1964 and subsequently set up his studio at the Chelsea Hotel in New York. American photographer Bruce Fritsch captured the artist at work one cold January morning in 1965, producing a set of rare, intimate images revealing a canvas coming into being. Gaitonde's masterful handling of atmosphere through a careful layering process, as well as his spontaneous calligraphic gestures made with a palette knife, attest to the artist's deep engagement with the principles of Zen. And I'll just give you a little anecdote. Um, we didn't know about Bruce Fritsch when we put the exhibition up in New York in 2014. Uh, but as a result of Holland Cotter's review on January the 1st, um, he wrote to us, uh, introducing himself and saying that he had met the artist while he was at the Chelsea Hotel in 1965. Um, and then we spent a year working with him to digitize all of his images and get them ready for the Venice exhibition. So these are some of the really wonderful accidents and possibilities that occur through the, through the curatorial process. <laughs>